Very good afternoon. How many of you here have heard or known about this person by the name Mark Twain? Please raise up your hands. Okay, so we have a very learned crowd here. Well, most of you probably wouldn't know that he made most of his income from speaking rather than from writing. And Mark Twain has been known to make all the wittier satires about public speaking. He once said that there are two types of speakers in this world. One, those that are nervous, and second, those that are liars. <laughs> so that is to say, if I am here and I'm not nervous, I'm most probably lying. <coughs> and I like to refer the nervousness. It happens for even the most seasoned of speakers. They all have what we call the pre-speech jitters. The kind of butterflies you have flying in your stomach before you enter the room. And I had that as well. And for the longest time, I've been finding or trying to find out what causes this nervousness. And I thought to myself, when did I start getting nervous? And for that matter, when was my first stage experience? And I noticed that my first stage experience was actually when I was nine years old. Then I received an award for being the top in my entire cohort. I was there for a prize presentation ceremony, and we were supposed to walk up the stage. And the very excited me, nine years old, I hopped up the stage. Only when I reached the center of stage, only to have my teacher shouted over the PA system, Benjamin Lowe, we don't need any penguins on stage. At that moment, everyone in the audience laughed at me. And that was my first stage experience. And for the next 12 years, that image stuck in me. Every time I think of a stage, it was a place where it was cold, like a penguin enclosure. It was cold, it was trapped, it was unfeeling. And that was the very notion I had about speaking. And this would probably continue on for the rest of my life until I met my mentor, who told me that, hey, there was something that you were not looking at. Because there was always something that you know, something that you don't know, but there will always be something that you don't know, you don't know. And that's what we call as blind spots in quoting. So I want to talk a bit about the fears of speaking as a speaker, of course. So there are many school of thoughts, fear of speaking. If you Google, which is exactly what I did, you Google, why do people fear public speaking? And you have a good range of results, ranging up to about 7,550,000 results for why do people fear public speaking. But the converse, I did the converse, and I was trying to test out. I asked, my, I asked Google, of course, why do people enjoy public speaking? And look at the results. We have number one, how to conquer public speaking fear. Okay, that wasn't what I asked for. You have the second result. I enjoy public speaking. Pretend, and it will become reality. <laughs> Not very convincing. And the fourth result. Um, in fact, the fourth result comes from, okay, there was actually a change. The fourth result uh, is, why would someone love public speaking? not very encouraging as well. So you notice that um, Google gives you this kind of answers, and it led me to have two kind of conclusions. One, Google isn't always your best friend, and he doesn't always tell the truth. But secondly, the part about speaking that fears a lot of people is the nervousness, but that is part of it. The more important thing was the negativity that surrounds it, the negativity that shocks public speaking, that caused a lot of us to be afraid of public speaking. So that's the first point that I want to touch as far as fear is concerned. And I did some research, and that has been said that since prehistoric times, there are four different kinds of conditions that are bad for survival. And these four conditions are standing alone, in an open territory with no place to hide, without a weapon. <laughs> and in front of a large crowd of creatures <laughs> staring at you. And you'll notice that this kind of image is probably set in the prehistoric times when men were cavemen and we were fighting very ferocious animals. But if you put it into the context of public speaking, I'm standing alone, I'm in an open territory without anywhere to hide except for the podium, I don't have a weapon except for a clicker, which if I threw it, I probably can't hurt anyone. And of course, I have a large crowd of creatures staring at me. So this 
is one of the biggest reasons why standing alone making a speech is very scary. So when you're seeing this, <laughs> you're actually seeing many of this <laughs> staring at you. The second reason why public speaking is very fearful, and if you notice, public speaking is really just like any skill that you take on, like cycling, like swimming. There is a learning curve. At the initial stages, it's always tough. You fall down and you try hard to scale up the learning curve. And I noticed for myself that if I were to think about the skills I've learned, take for example cycling, I have a confession to make. How many of you here don't know how to cycle? So I'm the rare one here. Okay? I learned how to cycle when I was 23 years old this year. And that happened when I was in South Korea. And we went to a park with a group of five other friends. And what happened was then when they came over, they said, hey, Ben, let's teach you how to cycle. And I say, no, let me be. Come back one hour's time, and I'll show you that I can cycle. And that was what I did. I sent them off. And in that one hour, I suffered more bruises than I ever had in the past one year. I fell down, and I fell flat on the floor. But truth be told, when they came back one hour later, I said, ta-da, I learned how to cycle. Can you give me a round of applause for that? <laughs> so it sounds like I'm glorifying myself, but the truth is, I asked myself, was it really a glorifying matter? And as I reflected, the truth was, I asked them out for that one hour, was really when the moment I fell flat on the floor, I didn't want the people that I know and the people that know me to look at me at my worst state. I didn't want them to judge me. I didn't want them to laugh at me or criticize me for the matter. And that very one hour was really about me indulging in this space where I could learn and fail at a certain skill. And I mapped that back to public speaking. And if you notice, this is what happens. You fail at cycling, you crash a lamppost. But there's an interface, which is the one hour of space that I had. And when I lift up the interface, I show my friends, tada, I have learned how to cycle. But if you map that into public speaking, the thing is, you have no interfaces. If you try to speak on your own, like what I'm doing here, there's no audience, that is called self-talk. That is not public speaking. And the only way to improve at public speaking is when you come on stage and acquire more stage time. That is, you start speaking on stage. But the thing is, sometimes the feedback that you get from your audience, while they are live, they are necessary. You only know whether you are making a good speech or a not so good speech when you see the reaction from your audience. But the downside is that sometimes their responses can affect us. I was running a workshop, rather, I was giving a public speech some time ago, and there was this audience, typical of Singaporeans, this middle-aged auntie that was doing a very typical Singaporean act while I was speaking, and it was very, very distracting. You want to guess what is it? Not SMSing. I mean, SMSing is very common. What else? Yawning. Yawning is normal. Sleeping. Nose digging. Nose digging, yes! <laughs> She was digging her nose through and out and through and out. And the thing about you delivering a speech down here and someone digging the nose right there is that you start to put yourself into her shoe. You start to wonder, is my speech, the listening to my speech not that enjoyable such that you need to resort to digging your nose for greater enjoyment? <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of feedback you always get as, as a speaker. You have crazy audience, very special audience doing the plethora of actions. And the thing is, if you as a speaker, you can't take this kind of feedback, it doesn't feed you. Because the kind of feedback from your audience, they are chaotic. They are sometimes unintended. For example, I, I believe the auntie didn't want to dig her nose at that moment. I mean, in good faith, probably it got itchy back then. And if you take it to be personal, that you say, she is digging her nose, because my speech is boring. That affects you. So it's really about how you see the kind of reactions from your audience and what you take them to be a reality or a truth for yourself. So I talk about the fears of speaking. I want to go very quickly into the joys of speaking. And I only want to touch on one. 
And the joy of speaking is really about influence. About months back, I was running this training workshop with a very mixed group of audience, mostly young people, not older than 18 years old, and a couple of business executives ranging from their mid-20s to 30s to 40s. And throughout the workshop, I trained them in the techniques of public speaking. Towards the end, I set them off on a task. That is, I want them to deliver a three-minute speech on this title, on this topic. If today is the last day of your life, what would be one lesson you will want to share? So as expected, I got three audience, or rather three volunteers from the audience. One was the oldest one, about 40 plus years old, very steady, very composed, ranging to the youngest one, was 14 years old, student, his name is Ted as well. So the oldest speaker came up, nothing to fault him, very strong presence, great demeanor, um, very good control of the stage, and you would have expect, by virtue of his age, his experiences, he would have delivered this topic really well, don't you? So the thing was, when he went up on stage, he started to adopt a holier than thou position. He started to preach, and without long, or rather not after long, he lost his audience. And that was the waste. But the strange thing was, when 14 years old Ted came up, the thing was, of course, he was very clumsy, and he fumbled, and he was very nervous. But he touched on something that was very close to his, to his heart. He was sharing about a personal anecdote, about how when he was in a school camp, he missed out on one, one of the most important moments of his life. And that moment was the passing of his grandmother. And as he was sharing that, I noticed that his voice started to shake. His hands started to quiver, and the emotions were outpouring. And as he shared, I noticed that the audience were also into an emotional space. And some of them were teary-eyed. At the end of the speech, while I was doing feedback with him right in front, Ted said, sorry for being too emotional. And I asked him, why should you be? And I directed the question to the audience, how many of you, raise up your hands of course, how many of you were moved by Ted's speech? Almost everyone raised up. Keep your hands raised up if you are so moved to do something for a loved one. The same hands that were raised up continued being raised up. 14 years old Ted couldn't believe what he saw. And the truth is about public speaking is sometimes you have to dig deeper inside who you are as a person. Sometimes it takes you going to the truth of who you are. It takes you being vulnerable. It takes you being naked in front of the crowd. But it's when you embrace this vulnerability, this nakedness, and you connect to who you are inside, you give the permission to your audience to then connect with their emotions themselves and then be one with them. And that is empowerment. That is changing the world. And I just want to share and rather round off this entire speech with a chance encounter with a friend. His name is Bongani and he comes from Algeria. He's likewise into theatre and he loves public speaking. So one of the days when we were in India, of course, I asked him, Bongani, why do you love speaking so much? And he thought for a short while and he told me, Ben, the thing about speaking is that when you're speaking to a crowd of 50 people for 10 minutes, you're not just taking 10 minutes of their time. You're taking up 500 minutes of the world's time. Can you ever imagine what kind of impact you can make in the 500 minutes? Can you imagine if you as a speaker carry this paradigm into your speech creation and the kind of intention? What kind of speech? will you make? And for that matter, what kind of change can you make? So to round out my speech, the joy of speaking is really about influence. And when you can speak from who you are and the truth of what you really want to do in this world, there is only one singular influence which results, that is you change the world in the process. So I hope after you listen to this speech, relax because the fears can be decoded. The joy of speaking is immense. For when you embrace that, only then you change the world 
and you enjoy the process of having ideas worth sharing on the stage, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin.